The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. All right, we are back, everyone. If you'd like to go ahead and have a seat there, if you do that. Let's take our Bibles and open to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Matthew 8, verse 28. Kevin, is that your new baby? Thanks for bringing her. They're beautiful. The title of the message is The Authority of Jesus. Two, it's the second of that series. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much. Just for the joy of receiving from your word. Lord, we come this morning with a hunger, a thirst, a desire. We come longing to learn because we want that transformation that you bring about in us through your spirit when you take the word of God and begin to move it upon our hearts and our lives. We look to you, would you do that this morning as we study through your word in Jesus' name, amen. So here's the context of where we're studying in, in Matthew 8. Jesus has finished that great Sermon on the Mount, but looking at the bigger picture, it's this. And we mentioned it last week because it's such a right thing for us to put the thing in context. God so loved the world. God loved the world. And so he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him is not going to perish but have everlasting life. There's God's heart. He doesn't want the world to perish. The world is in a path of disaster. He does not want the world to perish and so he does something about it. He sends his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him. So Jesus comes and speaks those words of God, those words of life that they need to hear. Words that they'd never heard before, not of outer religiosity, but of inner transformation, change in the inner man. That's what God wants. That's what he speaks through Jesus Christ. And then when he finished that great message, the people were in awe because he spoke with authority. And they had never heard such authority before in a man. And they were in awe of it. Now, God was building something here, a testimony. Why? So that we might believe. For in believing in His Son, we believe then in the provision of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of restoration. And so therefore, we understand that God wants us to believe. Interestingly, as Jesus was coming down from the mountain, a leper met him. Now this was an important scene that unfolded and had, it has everything to do with what God is doing through Jesus Christ on the earth. He comes down from the mountain, here's a leper. A leper asked Jesus and said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Demonstrating that he believed there was a faith in the Lord. If you are willing, you can make me clean. The Lord said, I am willing. Touched them, touched a leper and said, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy left him. Then Jesus said, this is the key to it, Jesus said, now you go to the priest and you bring that offering which is prescribed in the law of Moses. This law, Leviticus 14, has been a provision, we studied it last week, that if a leper is ever healed, he is to bring this offering to the Lord. And so what's interesting is that there had never been a leper. Never in all of those hundreds of years, there had never been a leper that came to the priest and said, I'm ready to do Leviticus 14. Never, not one. All of those years waiting for Jesus to come under the authority of God, touching that leper. And so the leper went to the priest and said, here I am, I'm a leper, I've been healed. And so Jesus said, this is a testimony for them, and it's a testimony for us. Why? That we might believe. Then, Jesus, with his disciples, got into a boat. 
God demonstrated the authority of Jesus in another way. Got into this boat, you know the story, went into the Sea of Galilee. Jesus fell asleep in this boat. A great storm arose so that they were afraid for their lives. They're taking on water, and so they begin to be afraid, and they wake up the Lord. Save us, we perish. And the Lord confronted their lack of faith. You remember the story. He got up, and he immediately addressed them, and he said, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? He then commanded the wind, be still. And then he rebuked the waves. Peace. Can you imagine this for a moment? I mean, they were afraid of their lives. They're taking on water. The boat is tossed here and there and going back and forth. And then, don't you think they would have looked at each other? In fact, the scripture tells us they said, who is this? What manner of man is this? Even the wind obeys his voice. Even the sea obeys his command. Who is this? Now what is God doing? God is strengthening their faith by demonstrating the authority of Jesus Christ. And so we understand. In fact, John, the writer of the Gospel of John, at the end of that account, at the end of that Gospel, he says, these things have been written so that you might believe. And that's why we see the authority of Jesus Christ demonstrated so wonderfully. Now, when we get to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, we see the authority of the Lord Jesus here demonstrated yet again over the spiritual realm. And this is part of the unfolding story of God demonstrating through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, you look at this story... And it really is amazing because Jesus is going to confront a man who is demon-possessed. Now, he's not just a little bit demon-possessed. He, not just one demon, not just two demons, not just seven. Mary Magdalene had seven. No, more. In fact, when Jesus confronts and says, what is your name? The answer that comes is legion, for we are many. Interesting answer. A Roman legion was over 6,200 men. I'm not saying that's how many there were, but there was a lot. And here Jesus comes and demonstrates the authority of God. Many demons in this demon-possessed man, and Jesus demonstrates the authority of God. This is a great story. We need to see it. So here's, when you look at the story, there are things we need to understand. Firstly, we need to understand this. There is spiritual warfare in this world now. There is warfare about. You look at the things that are happening in the world. Is there any question? The warfare that we understand is for the souls of men. That's what it's about. It's about the souls of men. Now, some look at these verses and they believe, ah, they only apply during Jesus' time. They don't really apply during our time. Yet the scripture makes it clear that the demonic influence is in the last days. Notice in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. There he speaks of the later days. So we understand the spiritual insight that we gain from this story. Verse 28. Now when he had come to the other side uh, of the Sea of Galilee, into the country of the Gadarenes, the area of Gad, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. Now the, Matthew here relates that there are two men. Some of the other Gospels emphasize one. Clearly there was one who was the stronger and the dominant one. This is the one which the Gospels focus on. There... They come out of the tombs. Notice that they were so exceedingly violent, fearsome and violent, that no one would even pass by that road. And so you can just imagine, I mean, these demons inside are doing such that this man is gashing with stones, screaming and screeching about. There is a violence about him that no one wants to get near. In fact, it's interesting. If you kind of know that area, you've got the sea. And then, which is kind of in a bowl, you go up the mountain, and then you go up to the Golan Heights. But as you go up that mountain, there are caves, 
and therefore tombs. They would put tombs in the caves. And so this is where the man resided, filled with demons, screeching out and crying out in torment and anguish. You could hear them, no doubt, because of the way the water and the hill and everything was oriented. You can hear them. You out there fishing in that area, you can hear these men screeching and screaming out into the tombs. You can imagine the fear. We're not going over there. That, that demon, that guy, he's over there. No one would even venture onto that road. Jesus, and here's the great part of the story. Jesus and the disciples, after the calm of the sea, they pull their boat up where? Right there. Right where the demon possessed guy is. And so this is a great part of the story. So, verse 29, behold, they cried out. There's a confrontation. What do we have to do with you, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now, there was at a distance from them a herd of many swine, pigs. Uh, there was uh, uh, out there a herd of swine feeding. And the demons began to entreat him, saying, If you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, I love this part, he said to them one word, Be gone! I command the authority, Be gone! And they came out into the, and they went into the pigs, they went into the swine, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished into the waters. This is the first known case of deviled ham. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm ashamed of myself. I shouldn't have done it. It was like it was sitting right there. Everybody needs to hear that joke once in their life. All right, you heard it. All right. So anyway, uh, then, then they went into these, these swine, and then they all went into the sea. That would be a case of suicide. Okay, that's it. I'm done. No more. I'm finished. I promise that is no more. That's it. I couldn't help. I just had to do that one. So you look at this story. And there are many insights that we need. You know, when you start talking about spiritual warfare, clearly there is spiritual warfare. You start talking about spiritual warfare, and immediately people misunderstand. And I think one of the things we need to bring for an understanding is that we should not blame Satan for everything. Some people go to the wrong extreme, blame Satan for everything, every problem, everything that goes wrong, everything that's uh, against them. It's all Satan's fault. And they're giving him too much credit, frankly. I remember when I was a young guy and working in the restaurant as manager and got to know, uh, you know, our regulars. And there was this fellow who came in and, and he was relating to me a story one day that, that uh, he was having car trouble. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And he said, oh, I know exactly what the problem is. There's a demon in my carburetor. And I, I, I tried to convince him. I tried to tell him, look, Satan's got more important things to do than to clog your carburetor. But he was convinced. He was con convinced him otherwise. Then, there are those who want to blame Satan for their sin. The devil made me do it approach is a problem. The reason why that's a problem is because it takes away personal responsibility for our actions. It takes away personal responsibility for our own, our own decisions. Some are convinced that they have the demon of lust. Or they have the spirit of greed. And what they want is to be delivered with one, one great prayer of deliverance. One great prayer of exorcism. And they get rid of the spirit of lust. Wouldn't that be great? Just one prayer and oh, you're never going to deal with that again. Because we got rid of the demon of lust. Is that what the scripture says? James chapter 1, verses 14 and 16, gives us the insight that we need. Do you want to be spiritually victorious? Yes, of course. But then we need to properly understand it. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 16 explains, Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. It's part of the human condition. It's part of the body in which we live. He explains it. Then, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. He's explaining it here. It's the drive, the wants of the body. My body doesn't care. Our bodies don't care whether something is good or something is bad. It just wants. It doesn't care. He looks at ice cream. He doesn't care whether ice cream is good or bad. He just wants. Your body looks at donuts. I shouldn't bring up donuts Sunday morning. 
Don't touch that, Pastor. Don't bring up chocolate chip cookies either. Just bring up something else. Your body doesn't care. As soon as it sees a donut or ice cream, I don't, the body doesn't care whether that's good or bad. I just want it. It just wants the body. So what we understand, Paul makes it so clear, that the need is for the soul to bring mastery over the body. Notice what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. I will not be mastered by anything. This is Paul. I will not be mastered by anything. And then he brings up this. He says, food for the stomach, stomach for food. But God will do away with both of them. The body is not for immorality. The body is for the Lord. And so we get this great helpful insight. Do we want to be victorious? Yes, we want to be victorious over sin. Then the need is for discipleship. The need is for sanctification. That comes from walking with Christ day by day. This is the key that we need to understand. It's not, now I'm all for prayer. I think prayer is a wonderful thing. But when, when people think, oh, I'm going to be completely rid of it with one prayer, what they're missing is the fact that God wants us to walk with Him and we grow with Him in life. Sanctification is what happens as we grow in maturity in the Lord. What we need is to be filled with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. This is what the scripture tells us. Notice in Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. You don't want to sin? Well, here's the key. Your word I have treasured. I have valued it. Why is that important? The scripture helps us with that. It says the word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word is alive. And so when the Word, the Word of God, is written upon our hearts, it brings life. It brings spiritual life. Your Word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin. So I don't want to sin. Here's the key. The Word of God is alive. It's active. It's living. Sharper than the two-edged sword. Able to penetrate even to the soul and the spirit like bone and marrow. It is able because it is life to bring life. And now we talk about the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of the living God. Romans chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. If by the Spirit, we're talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. There is great insight that we all need. You talk about spiritual warfare. One of the things that we need to understand is this, that God wants us to be victorious and equips us. So God equips us for spiritual victory. He wants us to be victorious, and he gives us what we need so that we can be. There are so many examples in Scripture of God equipping believers Notice in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Here's a great one. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is our victory. Faith is the victory. Remember that old hymn? There's a great truth here. And so when the Lord confronted their faith, he was doing that to strengthen their faith. You have little faith. Notice and observe and watch that the Son of the living God has authority over the physical realm as he commanded the wind, as he commanded the sea, and the disciples no doubt were strengthened. Do you see the authority in this man? He has authority over the physical realm, and their faith is strengthened. We need to be persuaded. I love the way Paul wrote it. I am persuaded. I am convinced, I know that he is able. And there is that faith which is victorious. And where does faith come from? Well, here again, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing by the word of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. You see, he desires to strengthen us. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong, be in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. 
I'm going to give you provision. I'm going to give you and equip you for victory. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. He's got schemes. He's got plans. He's got strategies. But I'm going to equip you. You put on the full armor of God that you might be victorious. Now, James 4, 7 is great. Another great insight tells us, Submit therefore to God. Here is the key to spiritual victory. Submit, therefore, to God. We just studied this last week. Remember when the Roman centurion came to the Lord. And he said, Lord, my servant is paralyzed and in great pain. Jesus said, I'm going to come and heal. And I love this Roman centurion's answer. I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. All you have to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. And he explains his understanding. And he said, I too am a man under authority and therefore I have authority. And when I say to my servant, go, he goes. And when I say to my servant, come, he comes. And when I say, do this, he does it. Jesus looked at the man and was amazed. And he said, I have not seen faith like this in anyone in Israel. This is faith. This is understanding. What was it he understood? Jesus was under the authority of God, and that's why he had authority. And therefore, you talk about spiritual victory, we need to understand that we must therefore be under the authority of the Lord because that's where spiritual victory comes from. Submit, therefore, to God, being under that authority. You know what that means? It means when God says stop, the answer is stop. When God says no, the answer is no, there's a lot of people who don't go for that. They would much rather think about it. God, you said stop, but I don't know. I'm not sure if I really want to stop. You said no, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Let me think about that a while. No, when we are submitted to the Lord, there is a spiritual victory that comes. And then he says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now, Again, as we understand spiritual victory and, and warfare, one of the things we must also recognize is that in spiritual warfare, we must not allow the devil an opportunity. Don't allow the devil an opportunity. Scripture teaches, and we're going to look at this in a minute, the Scripture teaches that a believer in Jesus Christ cannot be possessed by a devil, cannot be subjugated by a demon. But, we're going to look at that in a few moments, but we are called to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We still, nevertheless, are in a spiritual battle, and therefore we must understand the schemes, the attack, there is indeed real warfare. And we need to understand it. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And I think we are living in a very evil day, more so even, I think, than what they lived in that, in that time. Think about the world, the direction the world is going in, the debauchery and licentiousness that is absolutely available today. He said, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm then. Paul wrote an example, and he spoke of a very personal thing. He spoke about our anger. He said, do you know that your anger can give the devil an opportunity? Be very careful, even with your anger. Notice this is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. I'm going to quote from the NIV here because it's very helpful. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. The devil wants to divide. The enemy wants to separate, bring division into your family, into the church, into your lives. That's the desire, the scheme, to bring division and disunity. And anger will give him an opportunity. Be very careful about your anger, he said. It will give the enemy an opportunity. Don't do it. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Be spiritually on the alert. Notice, 
Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. I like this. Firm in your faith. There it is. Strong in your faith. What we need to be victorious is that strength of faith. That walking with Christ day by day, having the Word of God written on our hearts, walking by the Spirit of the living God, there is victory. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 8, as we study these verses, let's look through them and understand great spiritual lesson and insight that God gives us. We really got to begin with what God is trying to demonstrate to us, that Jesus has authority over spiritual forces. This is what we must be convinced about. That's the reason we understand this section of Scripture, God is speaking to us. Let Jesus be known that he has authority over spiritual forces. Now, this is important because there are those who believe when they look at good and evil, they think that the forces of good and evil are somehow equal. They have some kind of Star Wars you know, mentality, you know, the dark side of the forest and the light side of the forest, and we don't really know who's going to win until the last episode. And, you know, we don't know. And there's this, uh, there's this tension and battle between them. Not so. The Scripture is so helpful, and this is one of those. No, Jesus has authority over all spiritual forces. Now, having said that, we also, however, need to recognize that Satan has a degree of power and authority. We do need to see it. Satan is called the prince of darkness. He is the prince of darkness. Darkness. When you look at this man, back to Matthew chapter 8, and you see the control of the enemy in his life, his personality has been subjugated. It's important to see. The man had no self-control, and the man could not be controlled by anyone else. The scripture tells us this account is given in other gospels. The book of Luke chapter 8 gives us an example that they tried to even bind this man with chains. And they couldn't bind him with chains even because there was a, 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 because of the demon force inside of him, he was physically strong and he would actually break the chains when they tried to bind him. And there have been other cases similarly where people who have experienced uh, a demon possession have been powerful physically. And so they could not control this man. And he could not control himself. Now, this is an interesting thing. He had no self-control. What's interesting about that is that, of course, self-control is a key to spiritual victory, isn't it? Self-control is a very important key to spiritual victory. But what's interesting is that the Scripture tells us that self-control comes from, is a result of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If you want to look it up, it's Galatians chapter 5. That there is self-control that comes. So this man had no self-control and no one could bring control over him either. So the demons had subjugated the personality of this man. And scripture then does clearly speak of the influence and power that we must recognize in the enemy. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 as an example. Paul wrote, in whose case... The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Have you ever wondered why it is that some just absolutely are hardened and refuse to receive? The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Ephesians 2.2 you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Now, we can relate to that one. You formerly walked according to the course of this world. Oh, yes, I did. You can just write my name there. I understand it. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Obedience? No way. Disobedient. That's the description rebelliousness, disobedience. That is the spirit now working in the world. Interestingly, Paul, as he was uh, giving a speech to King Agrippa, he was relating the 
time when he was commissioned by the Lord, he was on his way to Damascus and he was in the wrong direction in his life, the Lord confronted him, literally knocked him off his horse, blinded him. But as part of this, the Lord put a call on Paul's life. And so he's relating this to King Agrippa, but it gives us great spiritual insight. He tells us, this is Acts 26, verses 17 and 18. This is the word of Jesus speaking to Paul. I am sending you, notice now, to open their eyes so that they may turn, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Very important understanding. How insightful is that? What does he say? Notice. I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light from the dominion of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sin. There's what God is doing. God is forgiving sin. I love this part of the story because it helps us to stand in awe again of the forgiveness of the Lord. No matter what someone has done, God stands at the ready to forgive, to reconcile, to redeem. When we come and say, Lord, I repent of those things, God stands at the ready to forgive. It does not matter. You walked in the course of this world. Oh, I walked in the course of this world. Something awful. Well, God stands at the ready. This was the message that God gave Paul to speak of. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 8. This is important to understand because what God is demonstrating is that Jesus is the strong man in the believer. What does that mean? Jesus is the strong man. The authority and the power of Jesus is demonstrated. This man was so violent that no one would pass by that road. And they could hear the screams of him out there on the water. So where do you think Jesus brought up the boat? Right there. And so here comes this man violent, no one would want to come near him. And, he, and here comes this man, you know, to, to, uh, to, towards Jesus. Now, at that moment, I can just picture this scene in my mind. And the disi- I just picture the disciples all kind of standing behind Jesus, kind of getting in line behind him. Well, you go ahead, you go ahead, you deal with this guy. But Jesus is unafraid and unmoved. He's not afraid. Instead, what we recognize is that they are afraid of him because of the power and the authority that Jesus is demonstrating here. Now, what's interesting is what they knew. When you look at their account, what they know comes through the story. Notice verse 29. They knew who Jesus is. Notice, what do we have to do with you, Son of God? Interesting, isn't it? This is the first time that Jesus is referred to as the Son of God, and it's by the testimony of demons. Don't you think that's interesting? In Mark chapter 1, verse 24, Jesus confronts another demon-possessed man, and this is the conversation. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, this is important for us to understand. The demons know who Jesus is. We can be certain of this. There are no atheists among the demons. We know this. There's no agnostics among the demons. We know this. James tells us the demons believe in God. You believe in God? Great. The scripture says even the demons believe in God, and they have the sense to tremble about it. This we need to understand. They knew who he was. And they knew that he had authority over them. They entreated him. If you're going to cast us out, please. They, the scripture says in Luke 8, they asked permission. Cast us into the, to the swine, we ask. Don't send us into the abuso, the abyss. They knew that he had authority over them. Interestingly, back to verse 29, they knew a final judgment was coming. Have you come here to torment us before the time? They knew that there is a date set by which there is going to be a spiritual accounting and a judgment to come, and they know the end of it. They know the result of it. Have you come to torment us before the time? 
So we look at this story, and our confidence is in His authority. That's the key to our own spiritual victory, is it not? We know that Satan is a liar. We know that he is the father of lies. That is the way of attack. That's his primary method of attack. He's a liar. How do you counter a lie? With the truth. And here again, Jesus speaks to it. This is uh, uh, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If you continue in my word, if you will abide, stay, live in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Want to be free? Here is the key. We need to know with all certainty of the authority of Jesus, the power over the demonic realm, that he is the strong man in the life of the believer. Jesus explained, this is a principle, this is a spiritual principle called the strong man that he explains for us. It's found in Luke chapter 11. It has everything to do with spiritual authority. Luke chapter 11, verses 21 to 22. Jesus says, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. Okay, so Jesus gives a picture of a house. Now, all right, let's use my house. Who is the strong man in my house? That would be me. Right? So if a robber comes in the middle of the night and wants to attack the house, I'm going to confront him. I'm not going to ask my wife. I'm not going to nudge her and say, Hey, I think it's a robber, honey. You better go deal with it. I'm not going to ask my wife, I'm going to confront, I'm going to be the strong man. I'm not going to get my kids out of bed and say, hey kids, you better deal with some problems here. I'm going to be the strong man in the house. So Jesus used that as a picture. And he says, now if there's a strong man, fully armed, fully armed, he's, he's armed to the teeth, and he's guarding his house, hey, his possessions are going to be undisturbed. That is... Unless someone stronger than he attacks and overpowers him. Then he will take away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes the plunder. He'll have out the house if he can bind the strong man. Now, this is a very important picture for us because certainly the principle, this is the principle by which Christ overpowers Satan. So, you look at a man who is demon-possessed. Who is the strong man in the life of the one who's demon-possessed? Answer, Satan. He is the strong man because the man who was demon-possessed has his personality subjugated. So Satan is the strong man in that man's life. So what Jesus explains is that he then comes and binds the strong man. He binds Satan, casts him out, and then he can cleanse the house. He can say to the demons who are squatting, out, get out of here. He cleanses the house question. If Jesus binds a strong man in that house and casts them out, who's the strong man now? Answer, Jesus Christ. He becomes the strong man in the life of the believer. We need to understand this because it helps us to understand why it is so that a believer cannot be possessed or subjugated by a demon because the Holy Spirit of the living God takes up residence in that believer. God is not into time sharing. We need to understand it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of the living God dwells in you. Don't you find that wonderfully encouraging? The Holy Spirit of the living God dwells in you if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Then we see Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. I knock on the door. And if anyone hears my voice and will open the door, he's speaking, of course, of the heart. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door of his heart, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. There'll be communion, there'll be fellowship. There's that picture of the believer, of the one who asked Jesus into his heart. Now, if I was the strong man in my house, and I ask Jesus into my heart, and he comes and takes up residence in me. If Jesus is taking residence in my house, 
and a robber decides to come and try to bring attack onto that house when Jesus is staying in my house. You tell me who the strong man is now. Answer, Jesus. And who's going to overpower him? The, the, the enemy knocks on the door. Jesus will answer the door. You got something to say? See, now we say it that way to demonstrate the authority and the power of the Lord. Who's going to overpower him? He becomes a strong man in the life of the believer. This we must understand. For it is everything to do with our spiritual victory. There are too many who doubt. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm afraid. And they think, oh, I don't know who's going to win. Why are you afraid, Jesus said? Oh, ye of little faith, watch as Jesus speaks the command. Be gone. Spiritual victory is ours because Jesus Christ is the strong man in our lives. We need to know this. We need to be convinced of this. We need to stand on it. This is our faith. Now, the story ends interestingly because after this happened, the herdsmen ran away and they went to the city and they reported everything, including the incident of the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And this is the part that is really fascinating. They, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. What would you hear next? What do you think comes next in the story? They come to meet Jesus. Who is this man who has authority over the demons? You've got to come. You've got to come. You've got to come. You've got to meet my family. You've got to come and speak to our city. You, we need revival. You got a power. You have authority over the demons. You got to come. Is that what follows? No, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they entreated him to depart. Can you leave, please? Apparently, Jesus was bad for business. Their investment took a bath. Okay, sorry, that was bad. What are we going to do? We can't have Jesus around. He's bad for business. I suggest that if Jesus is bad for business, you're in the wrong business. What are you doing raising swine? What are they doing? This is a Jewish culture where the word of God was clear. You know what they were doing raising swine? I'll tell you what they were doing raising swine. They were selling to the Romans. Making some money on it too. Can you leave please? It's kind of bad for business. You know what's interesting? Jesus honored their request. He got in the boat and he left. Okay. There are those even today. Jesus can uh, you know, I, can you just leave? Okay. All right. Now, the man who is healed from the demons had a very different response. We understand from the other Gospels that he came to Jesus Can I come with you? I'll go with you wherever you go. I'll stay with you wherever you stay. Can I just spend my life with you? Isn't that a right response? Jesus answered and said, I want you to go home. Go home. I want you to go home and I want you to proclaim all the great things that God has done for you. I want you to go back and declare it. I want you to go and say and tell everyone what God has done for you. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we should also receive from that? Go! Tell others what the Lord has done. What a testimony. This man. What a dramatic transformation. There he was, cutting himself, shrieking out. No one could control him. Naked, living amongst the tombs and the caves. And here came Jesus, healed him, set him free. When the, the people from the city came, the scripture says they saw him sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind, fully dressed. That's transformation. God had healed him. Can I come with you? I'll go wherever you are. Jesus said, I want you to go home. Now, Stop with me and look at that. This is found in Luke chapter 8, verse 39. This is what Jesus said. I want you to go back to your house. Now, where had this man been living? In the tombs, in the graves. 
amongst the dead. Outcast. No one wanted him. I want you to go home. See what Jesus was doing? You, you can only guess, but don't you have to wonder if maybe this guy had a wife? Maybe some kids? And he'd been violent? He'd been trouble in their lives? At some point, they couldn't take it anymore. Get out! Can't take this anymore. No one wanted him. No one wanted to be around him. He's violent. But when Jesus came and touched him and transformed him, I want you to go home. I want you to tell everyone what happened. Tell everyone the great things that God has done. You know what's interesting? The man had no theological education. The man had no great spiritual training. I mean, he spoke Greek, but everybody spoke Greek. He simply told others what great things God had done. Can't we do that? Can't we do that? Just tell, you know, the world is lost. The world needs hope. You know anyone that's lost? Just tell what others, just tell what God has done. It reminds me of the story. This is found in John chapter 9. Tell, it reminds me of the story of the man who was born blind. Jesus encounters him, makes this clay, rubs this clay in his eyes, and tells the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is in Jerusalem. So the man goes, he washes his face, his eyes in the pool of Siloam, and immediately he's healed. He was born blind. And he washes and he's healed. Well, he's of course amazed, and so they take him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees don't believe it. And so they go and get his parents. And so they bring his parents in. Is this your son? Yes, that is our son. And we can testify that he was born blind. Now how he sees now, we don't know. Ask him. And so they turn to the man. Give testimony. The man is a sinner. The man who touched you and healed you is a sinner. He did this on the Sabbath. <laughs> I love the man's response. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But this much I do know. I was blind, and now I see. That's what I know. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your encouragement in your word. We understand their spiritual warfare. We understand, Lord, that you equip us to be victorious. Lord, we want that. We need that transformation. We need the infilling of the Holy Spirit of the living God. We need to be changed. So church, this morning as we are before the Lord, as we are praying, as you continue to pray, I ask this, if there is anyone here this morning who does not know the Lord, if you have not asked Him to be Lord and Savior, to forgive your sin, to heal, to touch, to transform, this is what you say. Lord, I repent of my sin. Would you transform me also? Would you make me your son? Would you make me your daughter? I receive that forgiveness. I receive that life. I want to be made new in the Lord. Is that your heart? Is that what you would ask of the Lord? Would you just raise your hand if that's you? I want to just agree with you. I want to say yes and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else now this morning would say that? Lord, I receive. God bless you, friend. I see you there too. God bless you. Anyone else this morning receive that forgiveness, that healing that comes? Or maybe you're here this morning and you would say to the Lord, what I need is to be victorious. I know the Lord, but I haven't been walking with Him. I haven't been victorious in Him. Lord, strengthen me with that power and might and your authority. Bring that transformation to me as well. Is there anyone who would say that to the Lord? Would you just raise your hand to the Lord as well and just say, Lord, that's my prayer, my heart. This is what I need. God bless you all, each, as you say that. The Lord delights in that prayer because he loves to see lives transform. That's what God is doing, and God is doing it in you, and that's a wonderful thing. 
Father, we love the life that comes from you. We honor you this morning in it. We worship you. We recognize your majesty and the love that you poured out through us through your son, Jesus Christ. We honor you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, we're going to worship as we close. On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel...